If we had to pick a fan game that's most iconic within the FNAF series, you'll probably hear the same few answers from people. One Night of Flumpties, Five Nights of Candies, The Joy of Creation. Michael. What is going on? It crashed again. Though, there is one series that nearly every FNAF fan has heard about. Pop Goes. This little weasel would grow from a small project to its own mini franchise that will be talked about to this day. But how did this one character become so well known within the FNAF community? To find out, we'll have to take a quick deep dive within a short history of Kane Carter's works. This is a story of how one character launched a fan game so popular that it would be introduced within the Fan First initiative. The first real game introduced within a story isn't actually Pop Goes, which would be this game that would more resemble the original FNAF's formula. Instead, it would be Pop Goes Arcade, released on April 1st, 2016. This is a weird game. <laughs> Starting off with the description, it states the game as quote, In Pop Goes Arcade, you play as a child. You're not going to be killed by a mysterious man, you're not going to be stuffed into a suit, or given a mask to wear in purgatory. No. Today, you're going to play a damn game on the top of the line Pop Goes Pizzeria arcade machine. Already, we understand that this isn't the normal FNAF fan game that we're so used to. A lot of the more popular fan games around this time and even today always followed a very similar pattern of doors, lights, and cameras. So to my surprise, this game actually takes the form of a child playing an arcade machine. Even with the description stated before, I thought we would have just been playing inside of an arcade location, not an actual 8-bit style game. Which, if you've been on the channel for a while, you'll know that I absolutely adore these kinds of 8-bit style mini games due to the nostalgia from FNAF 2 through 4. This feels absolutely ahead of its time, with the intro screen showing off a single arcade machine with the real menu presenting the Weasel World game that we were told about. I will just state that I never played any of the Pop Goes games before, nor do I have any knowledge about the lore at all, so everything that I will be seeing is from fresh eyes. Actually entering the game, we play as Pop Goes the Weasel. Already, this game subverts all expectations, as instead of having the usual horror elements that these kinds of stylized games present, it instead shows itself as an RPG. We walk around destroying various different animatronics, collecting coins, and could even upgrade ourselves at this shop, increasing our attack, health, or getting new healing. At first, this kind of gameplay was interesting and really felt different from any other FNAF fan game I have ever witnessed. Though, after just a few minutes, it did kind of get stale. The walk-in animation for Pop Goes is so slow, and the amount of encounters you get feels like walking around in a Pokemon cave without a repel. After a while, we will find a castle which has this Dumpty's boss in front of it and is a pretty neat throwback to the One Night of Flumpty series. No garden animals is found in the first room inside. I don't know anything about the lore yet, so we'll just have to find out what this place holds for us as we begin to follow this weird glitching mess. Ooh, spooky. Not a lot happens between this and the final boss of the game, who is King Cultivate. A green farmer with a crown. At least, I think it's a farmer? You stupid animal. You will starve. You freaks. You are evil. And we won! Yay! That's basically the whole game, a short playable teaser for the actual game that will come out soon. Except, there's one more secret location that we could find. Within this dark house, there are two white silhouettes, one of a person and the other of a person wearing a rabbit mask saying, Look Dad. Walking even more leads to a bunch of different locations found within the FNAF 3 minigames, until we find Bonnie who... A black animatronic's hand will come out and grab the screen only to crash the game. Now, this game was weird. It definitely didn't fit in with any other fan games, but the only real significant part that I could find was a secret ending with everything else seeming to just be 
filler or something to just distract the player so only the most dedicated fans truly get the whole experience of seeing the animatronics hand. Like I said, this was just a playable teaser to the very next game so although it didn't have much within it, it still did its job in my opinion, creating a game that would entice the players to find out more about the series and what it had in store for us. Before the game's launch, even more teasers would be presented, something taken from someone else. Already giving a callback to the original series with Freddy's face spliced in. Now, it is difficult to try to create unique looking animatronics that don't feel copied from the original since most of the popular animals that are commonly used within animatronics have already been created, such as the iconic chicken, bunny, fox, and bear, with many others making their own individual creations and various different animals as well, usually those associated with farms and domestic life. So with the introduction of Pop Goes the Weasel, it really felt like its own design not inspired by any previous animatronics presented, even cleverly finding the name from the well-known nursery rhyme, which in my opinion only strengthens this character even more due to my own personal enjoyment of using childish things to create fear, such as using a doll to create Chucky and how party clowns have been made terrifying throughout the years. There also appears to be this weird obsession with the word evil within a lot of teaser images, what could this mean though? Well, to find out, we'll have to jump into the game. Now, my previous statement about never playing any of the games is only half true. I only played this specific game for 4 nights on stream before saving it for this video. Other than that, all the other interactions I could have had were completely avoided. So, on June 26th, 2016, the official Pop Goes game would be released for the public. The visuals and location were beautiful. Although this was a pizzeria, this wasn't some old fashioned location but instead was taking place in the future. Of course, this meant they could really explore some of the more modern technology that the original games during that time really couldn't, which will be talked about much later on. Already the voice acting is absolutely amazing as we get launched in with the introduction of this game's version of the phone guy. First night on the job, I'm rambling a bit, it's a lot to take in. And yes, I know there are a bunch of anthropomorphic plastic animals around you watching you work. Trust me when I say I know how that feels. Your imagination might get a tad bit out of control. Stress does that to you. But don't worry, you're completely safe here. I like I said, I love the voice acting in this game quite a lot, and I truly mean it. However, the fact that there are dialogue options within a fan game was something that just elevated the experience. Personally, I believe that the best kinds of horror games are the ones that immerse the players into the world that they are playing in. The more we feel connected with the in-game character, the more terrifying things can get. That's why a lot of horror games love to use first person since third person may not feel as effective. This phone call starts by explaining some of the gameplay elements, which I'll touch on soon, with the dialogue options for the first night being, what is the room shutdown button, what are the robots capable of doing, and how is this place during a day? Not only do these three options create replayability for the game, but it also gives the player a sense of control of what information they want to digest really splitting the fanbase into three categories. The first explaining how the gameplay mechanics actually function to those who want to be more capable, while picking the second are catered to those who are more interested in how the animatronics themselves function within its universe, and the final appealing to those who are more invested within the world building aspects of the series. It's little details like this that could drastically change the impact that a game can actually have. Yes, it may not seem that big overall since a lot of other games have this mechanic in introduced, but for FNAF fan game, known to attract those who are heavily invested with the lore, this kind of thing really makes this section feel memorable. Moving on, you probably noticed that the little phone thing in our hand, this is how we access the camera's event system and how we do the room shutdown mechanic. For night one, we had to worry about only two animatronics, the first being the iconic Pop Goes the Weasel. He starts right behind us but will slowly enter the various rooms scattered around. Instead of the normal keeping him away from us directly, we need to keep him out of the room's printers. You see, he doesn't usually jump scare us. Instead, how he functions is he will use the 3D printers that are in different individual rooms in order to create an animatronic part that belongs to a black rabbit. Most likely the same black rabbit from the previous teaser. 
This could be challenging as he could be extremely quick and the rooms he will enter seems to be completely random. If you don't manage to use the room shutdown button fast enough before he prints out a part, he will take that piece and drag it to your office area in the table behind you. There is nothing we could do to stop or even slow him down once he actually prints out a part. What's interesting is this mechanic where we could survey the room around us doesn't seem to be that important except to know three things. The first being, how many parts has Pop Goes managed to bring to you? Now, if you're complacent and somehow he collects every single part into your room, Black Rabbit, unique name I know, seems to be very similar to Shadow Bonnie that was introduced in FNAF 2. I actually am a huge fan of the Shadow animatronics mostly due to the lack of any information we really have about them. Even though it's been many years, not a lot is known about their origins, though it is speculated to have to do with something with Agony or Remnant. His design is very simple, but pretty cool to me. Back to Pop Goes. The only thing I believe really keeps the mechanic balanced is the fact that once he uses a 3D printer, he will not go back to it and instead will have to find a different room, meaning you could sometimes predict where he'll end up next. I'll explain why this mechanic can be extremely stressful in later nights. You probably notice this panic meter rising slowly as well. This is due to Stone the Crow, who appears to be an animatronic that is simply used to hold a sign. I really love this concept since I believe every single animatronic that I've ever seen introduced within a FNAF fan game has always made their introductions within the location, usually done within a stage area or a back room, never outside. With the exception of Flumpties, but that game's locations are really weird. To have him hold the drive through sign outside is such a unique idea and the way he is used to prevent the player from abusing the camera system as well as to cause a sense of constant urgency is so well designed to me. You see, there's no such thing as power within this game, so to balance the cameras, the longer you stare at them, the more this panic meter will rise up. If the panic meter gets to a certain point, you will begin to see hallucinations of Stone the Crow on the cameras. Blocking your view, needing you to switch cameras as staring at him will only cause your panic meter to rise up even faster. He even has a bunch of different messages that could be shown, which are usually pretty cryptic or just him just threatening you. To make this meter fall, you would just need to look outside in order to calm down. Of course, an empty dark parking lot is just so calming to our player for some reason. Unlike most hallucinations within other fan creations, Stone the Crow can actually end your game if your panic meter rises up to the max, giving you a pretty cool jump scare. The first time this happened, it was absolutely terrifying. Although quick, it was really effective the way the two red eyes came crashing through from the window. It's not just Stone the Crow, but once the panic meter reaches its max, any of the various of animatronics will be able to jump scare you. It's just a matter of who will get to you first. I'll bring up the crow back up later on, on night 4, but for now, just remember two things. Make sure Pop Goes doesn't print out any of Black Rabbit's parts, and you have to check the window every few seconds in order to calm down. This was something that I kind of expected, especially with the previous playable teaser. But, after playing night 1, we will get thrown into an 8-bit minigame. Unlike most other minigames that take place within the same location or just in an area similar, we are thrown in a weird... I don't know what to think of this place other than it's dark. On the wiki it states it as a brain shaped location so it might be someone's twisted memories. To me this looks like a purple gorilla that we're controlling but on the wiki it once again says it's stone the crow so what do I know? This minigame stops when we enter a room where Balloon Boy seems to be tied up before it ends. What could this mean? I have no idea, this is confusing me so much so let's move on. On night 2, we get told about the heating systems within events, which is one of, if not the most stressful mechanics within this game. Once again, this game introduces something that I don't see quite often, and it's two animatronics that don't really separate from each other, walking around in a pair. 
Sarah and Saffron are both sister squirrels, and honestly one of the uglier designs I've ever seen. I know they're supposed to be squirrels, but their teeth just reminds me of Spongebob, and ultimately, to me, just makes them look kinda goofy. Their gameplay mechanic is one of the most frustrating things to me. Like I mentioned previously, there are the normal cameras and then there are the vent cameras. With the vent cameras, we could turn on the heat in a location, which just means we have lasers for some reason. <laughs> Not what I would have expected when I was told we were turning on the heat, but alright, if it works, it works. Every so often, we simply have to turn on the heat in order to prevent them from progressing, and their movement always stays the same. Going from cam 631257, then finally to you. Basically following the outer wall. The reason why this is so frustrating is the fact that once they progress, there's no way of causing them to ever back off. All we could do is just slow them down. It's not like we could keep the heat on for that long either. It keeps the laser wall up for a couple of seconds before turning itself off. With the in-game explanation being that it's done for safety reasons since if a person accidentally keeps the heat on for too long, it could cause it to overheat and implying that there could have been a fire in the past. If we somehow don't stop them from entering our room, they will come to the vent on top of us in order to take our phones away. Whenever your phone is taken away or somehow has its power completely disconnected, our panic meter will rise up almost instantly, resulting in any of the numerous animatronics to come in and jump scare us. Now the reason why this is one of the most annoying mechanics to me is the fact that we have to constantly keep switching cameras to find out where Pop goes is in order to prevent them from using the 3D printer since they don't have a set pathing. We'll never know where exactly he'll end up. That is not including the panic meter which only keeps rising the more we use the cameras. If we somehow do find Pop goes, we only have a few seconds to either look outside the window to calm down or turn on the heat. This only gets worse since they only get faster in later nights needing you to sometimes make the decision to let them progress with an event or stop Pop Goes from getting that extra part, really giving you a choice of how you want to plan out your strategy. Let me just state, a lot of not only the fan games but even the original FNAF games themselves do suffer from one major issue, and that is the gameplay loop, sometimes feeling way too predictable on what to do. For example, in FNAF 2, we basically have to do the same actions of wind a music box, put on a mask, and flash a light, repeating this until we beat the night. Yes, the AI does make it more challenging, but once you master this repetitive loop, it could essentially always beat the nights, even on the hardest custom night difficulty with some ease. Now here, there is no real gameplay loop, at least it doesn't feel that way since the location of where Pop Goes is, is completely random, making this experience to me feel fresh compared to other fan games. I really do feel as though this game was way ahead of its time with the perfect balancing of its gameplay elements, not making them feel completely unfair, but at the same time, not making them so easy they won't feel stressed at all. Though it could be understandable some people may not enjoy the specific loop as it could feel weird at times. The Night 2 minigame is basically the same as the first one except we walk around as Saffron the Squirrel, ending once we make it to Toy Freddy who is also tied up. Night 3 we get introduced to the Simon Says mechanic which is a pretty unique concept as well. This is tied to the new animatronic that becomes active called Blake the Badger. He will enter the server room where he will try to shut off our phone thing in our hand leaving us defenseless against the other animatronics. When Blake enters that room, the monitor on the right will show a specific color, which is when we need to press the same exact color on one of the buttons under our monitor, then call Blake with the big yellow badger button. This is a pretty cool and different mechanic that once again wasn't something that I've ever seen before. Time and time again, this game surprised me by the amount of different elements it has introduced, surpassing all my expectations that I had about it especially due to it being a game made in 2016. I'll be skipping over the rest of the 8-bit After Night minigames due to them just basically the same except with new animatronics. The fourth night doesn't introduce a new animatronic but instead causes Stone the Crow to change slightly. He still has the same features as before, showing up as a hallucination on the camera systems, however on this night, he will begin to look through the window if you stare at that direction for too long. This was to make you not feel comfortable as his window part was probably the only time 
where you would actually get to relax before needing to go back to the various mechanics that would require quick thinking. Also, him staring straight at you from the parking lot is absolutely terrifying, and I love it. Night 5 doesn't introduce any new mechanics, but all the animatronics are much more active, making this quite difficult. Although difficult, it didn't feel unfair. After a few attempts, you'll be able to beat it quite easily. Night 6, we don't have any more dialogue options. Instead, it's just one simple short message. I was thinking about some things. This is my last one. I feel like I haven't been honest enough with you. I've been trying, please know that. But some things I just... I have a question for you. A serious, personal question. I'll try to set an example. There's this uh, person that's really close to you. He's recently been acting strange, maybe a bit scary. People say he's done horrible things. But you've trusted him for all your life. He's been listening to your problems and you really look up to him. Even if this person has made big mistakes in his life, if he does regret it in the end, would you be willing to forgive them? know who he is, would you look past his errors and try to bring him back into your life? Do you think you can trust him? I, I, no, this will do. Thank you for working with me so much. This is the end of your shift at the Pop Goes Pizzeria. Let me know your answer. A simple call, most likely talking about who he knows one person, maybe William Afton or someone who is exactly like him has done some horrible things but doesn't know what to do with that information. This is a game that's taking place within the FNAF universe and was even established to do so. Though probably an alternative universe with similar events of when the Fazbear franchise existed but had to be shut down due to multiple controversies it had over the years. With this new franchise, the Pop Goes Pizzeria is trying to take its place. So, who is this new person he knows that did a horrible thing? It can't be William Afton since this most likely was after the events of FNAF 3. Anyways, just like the fifth night, this seems to be just a harder version of the previous shift. Though, beating this night leads to a different screen. Instead of having a minigame, we are told to find the truth. We unlock a couple of different things, but the most interesting is the custom nights ranging from super easy to impossible. <laughs> I am probably just really bad at this game. So this took me around 20 tries or so? Around 20. I almost lost my mind trying to beat this challenge, but after so many attempts, we finally did it. To be dropped into this cutscene. <laughs> It seems to be the whole life of the purple guy, but for some reason, his skin actually became purple. In game, I believe he was just a normal person, with the official FNAF lore aside from the small oopsies he did in his life, like... Serial child on a liver, mutilation, corpse excretion, blackmailing, death threats, kidnapping, vandalism, endangerment, attempted felicide, child abuse, corruption, torture, and probably a lot of other things. Other than that, a normal human. 
Why I think his skin actually became purple is due to the fact that people started to become wary of him, causing him to isolate himself from others since they started to view him as disgusting, giving him another reason to wear the Springlock suits for his crimes. Instead of just using it to lure children, it was also a way to mask his grotesque appearance from others as well. There was one last hidden ending where you need to find this thing. He will only appear on certain cameras at specific times. When you do find him, you'll need to press one of Simon Says colors that matches his eye color. How are we supposed to know this while playing the game without using a wiki? Don't ask me, but this is probably one of the most confusing ways to add a hidden ending next to probably the FNAF 3's hidden minigames. Then, after finding all the times he shows up on the cameras, you'll need to play the After Night minigames which slightly changes with the only difference being that you'll now destroy the tied up animatronics. There are definitely more changes, but they aren't very relevant. On the final night, this is what will happen. What does this mean? Are they going to be important? Why did someone put a papyrus AU design into this game? All things I can't answer for now. That's most of the content related to this game and honestly it was a pretty fun experience. Definitely challenging at points but that only made me enjoy it even more. The various different mechanics all felt different and unlike any other FNAF fan game that I had played previously. This took any expectations I had and exceeded them. I really wasn't expecting much from it, mostly due to it being released all the way back in 2016, but thankfully, I wasn't disappointed. So with me finally finishing up the game, especially after failing the impossible difficulty from the custom night 20 times in a row, I decided to take a little break before starting the next game within the series. Last thing, if I get one more comment on my FNAF VHS video talking about how this thing was from the Pop Goes game, <laughs> I definitely didn't know where they were from before, but with the dozens of comments made, I definitely do now. Apparently we're an AI named Strings and is a character we play with in this game. Not only comments, the amount of people DMing me about this one character was actually kind of funny. Why did Kane decide to do this? Because why not? April 8th, 2017. This was another interactive teaser. Once again, we get introduced with an arcade machine with a game called Fazbear World, The Phantom Scourge. The first arcade game from 2016 was a much smaller project that could be completed pretty quickly. However, this one seemed to try to include a lot more. It still followed many of the core concepts of the previous one, such as being an RPG style game. Instead of playing as Pop Goes Again, we instead play as JJ, the female version of Balloon Boy. Which was an animatronic I definitely did not expect for us to control within this game. The plot is pretty simple. There was a virus put on the land corrupting the four kings that controlled the four main areas on the map. Every time we would beat one, we would get an animatronic mask that we could wear. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy's. With one more available, but that's for later on. Every time we unlock a new mask, we get the option to wear it in order for the members of the same family to give us a quiz so we get more money. There was another reason why these masks were so important, and that's because we need them all so we could face off against the Lord Puppet, <laughs> the final boss. In all honesty, this was a pretty difficult fight if you come unprepared, since its attack pattern is using the rest of the bosses against you, making them attack multiple times in one turn. What's a pretty cool concept is he has this little window where he has to choose which animatronics to use against you. If you put on the right mask at time, you could heavily mitigate the damage that will happen against you. After a while, you should be able to finally beat him, and there you go, you finally beat the game. Except, there was a mask we haven't talked about yet. There is a secret location that will lead us to Shadow Freddy, 
We don't fight him. Instead, he will give us a mask and tell us to meet up with him later after we complete our mission. If we do put on a mask, we will cause the world to have a purplish hue and changes the music to be much more ominous. His quest is for us to find four secret shadow cupcakes scattered around with another golden cupcake that is found within the puppet's realm. If we do manage to find all these cupcakes and make it back to Shadow's Freddy Cave, someone will talk to us for a bit as we wander around. Some say it was a monster. Some say it was a company trying to cover up some fatal malfunctions. And some say it was real. A man doing it all for some sick pleasure. Well, I never gained any pleasure from it. I didn't care. I just needed what only they had, so I took it from them. Do I regret the pain I caused? Some of it. But you can't say the results don't speak for themselves. Look at me. Do you see what I've turned into? In the end, I was right. Before this happens. <laughs> The final speech was obviously in the perspective of Willie Mafton after he became Springtrap. Now, gameplay wise, this was a pretty boring and grindy game, in all honesty. I didn't have much fun as the same analogy from before can be used here, except now you're trying to evolve a Magikarp into a Gyarados, only grinding using Zubats. If you know, you know. Oh boy, I cannot wait for the next Pop Goes game. Ah ha 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 <laughs> So like I said, this was an interactive teaser and it was for a game called Pop Goes Reprinted, though that game would be cancelled completely. I won't be talking about any of the cancelled projects in detail within this video since there are quite a few cancelled games, and it really does warrant a whole different video to talk about the potential each individual project had, as well as what we knew about them. Now, although the previous teaser we just talked about definitely added quite a bit of content to explore and play through, it would be nothing compared to the magnum opus of the series. This is the first time I believe I've ever seen a FNAF fan game ever cost money, but for a game that had many hours of gameplay included and an overwhelming amount of positive reviews, this is probably warranted and only made me more excited to see what exactly this game held in store for us. Well, the original game would be free and called Pop Goes the Dark Forest, released on Steam on June 12, 2020. However, with a huge expansion like DLC called Pop Goes and a Machinist, released later on July 1st, 2022, which would be a built-in sequel like the description states, this technically was two games made into one. And hey, if Daco said it was a good game, then you know it's probably true. I'll be reviewing the whole entire thing, as this was a massive project filled with a lot of content and passion behind it. I've tried to find fan games that really push the limits of what exactly could be a fan recreation of the original FNAF series, and time and time again, I always get surprised at what exactly game developers can achieve when they put their hearts into a project. This is an amazing example of a game that is unlike any other. So, let's enter the original project that was released on June 12th, 2020. Already, this game's graphics seem to be a massive overhaul and improvement from the arcade game of 2016, really fleshing out the beautiful limits of what pixelated art can achieve instead of using the very limited 8-bit style visuals that are quite frequently found in many different FNAF fan games. We start off in this garden, which really reminded me of some sort of retro style Stardew Valley, playing once again as Pop goes. Our first goal is simply talk to Sarah, who is in this inn, who tells us that something is stranding the light from the forest and our job is to stop it. 
What I do love already is that the save feature can only be used if we talk to the innkeeper, which was something very reminiscent of some older fashioned RPGs like Earthbound or The Frogs in Mother 3. Call me old, but small nostalgic game elements such as this with its simplistic art style was something that drew me in a lot more. Now going west, we enter the autumn forest. And wow, <laughs> the combat already feels drastically improved with the character designs of each enemy showing them in much more detail. Let me just state, in the beginning of this game, there are only three things we could do. Attack, defend, and use an item. Basically the three things that the previous arcade games had for their combat as well. Things will change as we progress though. One of few criticisms I do have about this game is its main story, as it's very similar to Pop Goes Arcade 2, where we need to collect something in order to unlock an area to finally beat some final boss. Before it was the animatronic mask, but here we need to collect three keys that we'll get from the corrupt Chica, Foxy, and Bonnie bosses that will be found at the end of each forest that they reside in. Corrupt Chica is the first boss that we will encounter, who also has a special ability. Each boss has something unique to them that will cause them to be quite annoying to deal with, with her gimmick being this jump. She will simply jump over your attack so you'll deal no damage to her, though luckily she cannot spam it. I do have to admit, I was trying to grind for coins at points so I constantly press attack thinking that's all I really need to do and did lose quite a bit. Though this is really interesting to me. You see, as you progress, enemies naturally get stronger as there has to be a natural difficulty curve in all good RPGs. When I first entered the South Forest, enemies did pose quite a bit of a challenge to me and like I said, would sometimes wipe me out. But when I returned back to the West Forest, the previously difficult enemies would be extremely easy to defeat, really causing you to feel as though you aren't weak but slowly gaining more powerful. Every RPG does this but it feels really different here, especially with how most RPGs that I remember always balancing both leveling and itemization to optimize your character. But in this arcade game, you yourself get stronger, not with items but with pure raw stats. I don't know why that made me feel all the more powerful, but it did. Though this game loves to take away that feeling as Corrupt Foxy just absolutely one-shot me when I tried to fight him for the very first time. So yeah, back to the grind again to somehow defeat Foxy. I don't know who decided that this hook ability that just straight up does 60 damage for no reason on Foxy with good game design, but you're evil. The East Forest surprisingly was full of snow, and it really did the winter theme quite beautifully. Bonnie is the last boss we need to defeat before going to the North Forest, with his gimmick being he could dig up items to use in combat, which usually included something to heal him up, making this fight much more tedious than anything else. Not difficult, just annoying. Lasting a lot longer than it should have been, but after a while, it's time. We finally got all three keys from the three bosses that were scattered around. It's finally the point where we could enter the North Forest and see what is stealing the life out of everything around it. The North is different from anything we've seen before. All the trees seem to be dead, the grass is a charred black, and the enemies aren't corrupted, but instead usually skeletons have the name dead in front of them. Previously, everything was simply corrupted, but things don't feel right here. Even the music isn't normal. The happy upbeat OST is replaced with this mixed up mess. We push forward. Before that though, there are a couple of different things we could do to boost our chances of survival. This isn't an easy game that we could just steamroll through without much opposition. For one, Balloon Boy isn't a normal shopkeeper. Instead, he has a black market where we need to <laughs> <laughs> where we need to complete certain challenges like defeating a specific number of each enemy to unlock different power-ups, like increased crit chance. Not only that, we could go back to the areas where the previous bosses were in order to encounter the dead forms. A pretty dark and interesting concept, showing we aren't defeating our enemies but in fact ending them. Completely. 
Not only do we gain quite a bit of gold from them, we also gain their special abilities, not just for combat purposes, but to also help navigate the overworld, such as to jump over this hole with Chica's ability that we couldn't get over before in order to shut off this machine. The first of many that have been corrupting the forest animals in this area. Doing this will cause the enemies to no longer spawn in that forest, so make sure to complete Blue and Boy's quest before doing so. Not only are we able to get a new ability, but we could even upgrade them at the end, making them stronger or have a completely new use. Now, as much as I absolutely love the base designs of the forest animals, the dead skeleton form of Foxy is probably one of my favorites within this game. With the inclusion of the jump feature, this previously infamous fight is now a lot more simple as we could try to predict when Foxy throws his hook to ignore that massive hit. Also, we now have a hook to zipline over things, which is amazing. I take it back, whoever designed Foxy to have this hook to be part of the game was a genius. Can we talk about how amazing Dead Bonnie looks? His creepy grin, broken body, and his shovel all thrown again to have a pretty well designed concept. After beating him, we now have the ability to dig under boulders, which is just funny to see Pop Goes do. Whoever animated this definitely deserves some extra praise. This is what I meant before by the basic combat changing as we could slowly progress within the game. Needing to defeat the bosses, then defeat them once again in order to unlock their skills and diversify our capabilities within combat. At this point, we are able to make it deep into the forest in order to find a castle, which needs three keys in order for us to open it up. Okay, I enjoyed a majority of this game so far. However, this is something I do feel like needs to be addressed and talked about and that is its repetitive nature. I do enjoy the concepts of the dead bosses being something you have to defeat again in order to steal their skills, but the fact that we need to do that for every single one, then look for the keys for the castle, which means you have to explore each of these three forests three times individually. It could get really tiring after a while, but I do appreciate that we're able to basically turn off the enemies in each section so we aren't swarmed by them during our search for these new keys. There was also the shortcut ability we could upgrade to basically fast travel between the areas, but even then, it was still kind of annoying. But anyways, moving on. So finally, after making it back to the North Forest with all three keys, we could finally open up the castle. Our new goal is simple. Find and defeat whoever is in control of this castle. There are some books scattered around that probably have some hidden lore within them, but that'll be something to talk about in much more detail within another video. If this video somehow reaches 20 whole likes, I'll think about making that soon. Exploring around this area shows that there are no enemies, which is strange. Usually we get swarmed with new enemies, but all we could find are these abundance of coins, which just foreshadows how difficult this new boss will be, giving us so many coins in order to upgrade ourselves even further. So, we could finally make it to the final stage. Dead King Freddy is a really eccentric design, with his sight signifying how he's a new personification of death itself. Honestly, as a fight, this wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be, but that could just be due to how I grind like crazy to max out everything I could. After a while, you should be able to beat him with ease if you prepared with his last moments having some creepy animations. As he looks up to you one last time, not with some red glowing eyes, but instead with a soft blue, before he disappears, leaving just some ashes. And with that, we did it. 
as the various different animals gather around us to discuss the future and to celebrate what we just accomplished. This wouldn't be a Pop Goes Arcade game if there weren't some secret ending behind it all. This part is going to be confusing, but you could glitch through this wall to get this mysterious key in order to make it all the way back to this fountain. In order to get a new objective, save Bonnie. We don't go back to refight him in the forest. Instead, we walk around and gather the various different black parts to bring them back to the fountain. This part may take a while since the parts are scattered in the various different areas of the map as you will hear the soundtrack become much more creepypasta-like. Much more eerie. Once we find all the parts, we are told to just find her. There is one fountain hidden away that we could enter. Having these jumbled up minigames similar to those from FNAF 3 once again that we will need to glitch through until we... I guess that's the end of the game, right? Not entirely. If we do the same exact thing over again, but instead don't attack Bonnie... The game is glitching more and more, but we need to keep defending to find out everything that Bonnie is trying to tell us. It appears that Bonnie, or the soul that belongs to Bonnie, was a real person at one point, who is now trapped within this machine. They were the daughter of the man who created this whole game, questioning a bunch of things before attempting to move on somehow. Move on to the afterlife, or move on to a new animatronic in the real world. That much I'm unsure of for now. There's one more secret we could uncover. If we do everything, unlock everything, save Bonnie, then go back to defeat Freddy once again... This, apparently, is one of very few teasers for the Pop Goes Evergreen game. Before I give my entire opinion about this game, since there's quite a lot I want to talk about, <laughs> let's move on to Pop Goes and The Machinist. We once again start off in the garden and make our way back into the inn. It's been a month since the event of the previous game. For some reason, there's this massive hole that we must go down with the speaker introducing themselves. We can see three different color scanners, which will need to find three different color key cards. Okay, I think you can see where this is going. I'll save talking about this for now until much later on. As we enter the forest, the previous corrupted enemies we had to face are now replaced with robots, which is something I enjoyed, especially with the whole sci-fi theme that this DLC was trying to go for. Even better was the fact that a lot of these robot enemies were just a regular cast, but more metal? You can even find a rusty pop goes. You are quite literally a weasel finding a robified version of yourself. I like that. Pop goes walked, so Sonic and Metal Sonic's rivalry could run. There were even these coin bots which were the robot versions of the standard mimics, not the one from Security Breach, the ones that you could usually find in a lot of the earlier fantasy based RPGs. Now, I won't be going into much detail since a lot of the early gameplay was very, and I mean very similar to the original core gameplay, of going into the forest, fight the bosses to get a key, in this case a colored key card, then go back to unlock a new area. The robot versions of these boss characters were decent, but weren't something that I was entirely invested in. 
personally the dead versions were just something I adored more, except for Pristine Bonnie but that's only because its design was very much inspired by Withered Bonnie. Though its fight took a whopping 6 minutes just because they would not want to stop healing. It was actually kind of ridiculous. The speaker comes and goes as we make our way throughout the underground sections, and at one point tells us that there are cameras all around in order to study our movement patterns for some reason. As we continue forward, the idea of immortality is once again brought up. Freddy from the previous game talked about it, but his idea of immortality came from rising up from the dead, kind of like a zombie, I think. <laughs> but here, metal is perfection, staying forever alive within a machine. You could really create a horror game franchise about this kind of thing. Now, after collecting all the key cards, we finally get the chance to meet the machinist. It's what the DLC is named after. Who are they? Who is this menace that decided to try and take on the great Pop Goes the Weasel? Well, who cares? Let's break the game for now. You see, the North Forest is somewhere we aren't supposed to go constantly giving us error messages as we walk around. The gameplay was very straightforward of what we need to do. Get the key cards from the west, south, and east forest, then meet up with the final boss. Very simple. But what if we just don't do that, but instead investigate what the north has in store for us? In the boss room of where Freddy was in is a series of holes that we could fall into that seem to sometimes have these dev notes inside of it. Replace all of this with Robot Freddy mini boss, but that idea was apparently scrapped. Could this be a real game idea that the game devs had? Maybe. The deeper we go though, the more glitched out this location gets, to the point we can't even see the hole. That is until we meet Missing No? It's actually a series of camera files that we could just open. Okay, uh, <laughs> they look safe and healthy. I guess we could just ignore that for now. Let's just find more secrets that are hidden around, as in a hidden part of cave systems, we could find Mangle in all of their glory, messed up and dangling from the ceiling. This isn't a necessary boss, as you could skip over them without even knowing they ever existed. After beating them, they will give a little speech, almost as if they're scared to move on. Which is a pretty saddening thing to read, only to unlock Freddy's scythe, which replaces our hook. This probably has some deep lore significance… maybe? <laughs> Anyways, the machinist. Who's ready to find out who they are? Minora, they're the innkeeper by the way, I probably should mention that, who was kidnapped and the reason why we even came on this journey, and we could see her tied up in this cave. That is when we meet the machinist finally, this menacing threat. Who is? Morse the Mole? Um, okay. If you're thinking that this was a character that was never introduced within the Popco series, you're technically half right, since Morse the Mole was an animatronic that was supposed to probably be an original Popco's game, but removed for some reason. I genuinely love his design in this game, with him also having an amazing theme that got me in love with this game OST even more. In fact, the whole Pop Goes Arcade OSC has such an amazing bag soundtrack that you should really listen to it even when you're not playing the game. There's quite a lot of different quirks related to this boss, such as these lasers that tick down your health the more you wait for your next turn. This kind of reminded me of Sans from Undertale. I know that's a sin to mention, but I liked it. It was annoying to play against, but a good kind of annoying. And even at one point, once you get him low enough, the machinist starts feeling tired and saying, screw this, I'm taking a break, here's a robot to deal with while I nap. Something this game definitely excels in are the comedic elements from the dialogue between the characters. After a long and grueling fight, we are finally able to be him. It seems that Morse was just jealous. Pop Goes made his success with the failures of others, while he did everything on his own. His machine, his powers, everything, all for it to just crumble down. What a loser. We saved the princess and did everything we could, so we're a hero, yay! See look, there's even a heart right there. 
Seriously though, the dialogue after the Morse fight was actually something that was probably something really important to the lore and I definitely want to dig deeper into it when I get the chance. But for now, what happens after we actually beat this game? Maybe, just maybe, those 5-ish seconds were probably the best teaser I've ever seen for a future project, using the end of the previous one in order to really elevate this one to a whole new level. Truly amazing. Now, like I said, I'm going to just talk about what I thought about these two projects, and I do believe that they should be treated like they're two separate games. The first one had a couple of issues that I definitely want to touch on. I already talked about the repetitive elements, so I won't really talk about that in detail, but I feel as though that this could have just been due to certain restraints. However, the worst part about this had to be the ungodly amount of grinding I had to do in order to progress. The coins to upgrade your stats and concept was a unique take. It's like upgrading your gear in any RPG, but solely based on monetary wealth. The issue is the fact that most of this just felt like... filler? Personally, I don't mind endlessly grinding away in RPGs since it gives me an excuse to do that while watching other things, such as the Bannington Harmony and Horror tapes for my other video. But I could see why others may not be able to enjoy this the same way I did. One of the things I did really enjoy about this game were the visuals, since I found them extremely pretty at times, and the hidden teasers. There were a lot of comedic elements, like Bloom Boy having a hit list for some reason. I just, <laughs> that's my favorite. I think that's my favorite part overall. But the gameplay itself before and after getting the superpowers to me just wasn't that fun after a while. If I was just playing this game without doing anything else like watching another video. This is all just personal opinion and from someone who just got 200% in everything. Feel free to disagree. Story-wise though, I may not completely understand everything that's going on, but damn. I am extremely invested and definitely want to find out more. I'm not the type to just go and google the exact lore parts to find out the answers. I mean, even when I was on a wiki to find out how to get the secret endings, because knowing how to glitch through a wall is definitely something everyone should know I guess, I would skip through the story sections on purpose so I could try to piece things together myself. Now moving on to the machinist part. Once again, it suffers from the core concepts of hey, collect these three things from these bosses and come back to me. Though the music is an absolute banger from both these games and I'll probably be using them for the background audio for this video since I just love it that much. The comedic parts here definitely felt stronger as well as the hidden sections being much more... <laughs> Let's just say I just got a lot more invested in it. Especially with the cameras found in the North Forest, Mango sounding sad about her situation, and finally, one of the best teasers I've ever seen for a game. Although technically this is just supposed to be a playable teaser, I do still consider both of these games to be some of the best the FNAF community has ever created. If there's something you want to do right when creating a FNAF fan game specifically, it's to create lore that will entice the players to want more. It's one of the main reasons why the main series blew up so much and one of the main reasons why I love to play fan recreations of the story. I want to see where King Card is going to take the series. So far, there's been a lot of cancelled projects which I will talk about in a later video, but for the projects that have been presented and created so far, it has made me into a giant fan of the series. I want to see Kane succeed and create a project that will blow people away, which is where we will finally make it to technically the final entry of the series so far. April 3rd, 2023 
we get another interactive teaser to Pop Goes Evergreen in the form of a weird cutesy kind of game. It starts with someone named Bonnie opening up a box of memories before taking us 15 whole years in the past. On our 10th birthday. This is where we enter this game with some more amazing music. We can do three things, drink water, cook some pizza, and eat them. Technically four since if we stand still in the middle we will start singing. In the corner we will see three bars, hunger, thirst, and boredom. I'll let you think about how we lower these yourselves. The first day is relatively simple since there isn't much we need to do. And quick thing, the small animations of Pop Goes doing anything like drinking the water, being idle, eating, just doing anything is honestly pretty adorable and I love it to death. Now, as each day progresses, this bar will rise up quicker, needing you to speed up your reaction time by quite a lot. Though, nothing really changes throughout the night except for the slight difficulty curve. If you do somehow die, like how I purposely died to show you what exactly happened, definitely didn't mess up at all, you'll make a thought bubble showing you what you messed up on. Seriously though, although this looks extremely easy, Night 5 was extremely difficult to try to complete due to just how fast these bars decide to move up. But after around 30 minutes, I finally did it, which takes us back to the future. That single frame seems to be someone with the Bonnie mask on top of it, only to be completely shut down into its box. And that's it. For now. Pop Goes Evergreen is a game all these teasers are leading up to, and I cannot wait. On the wiki, it states it to be perhaps releasing somewhere in the year 2024, so potentially, if following the pattern of previous entries, this game will most likely be released around April through July. Though I could definitely wait for much longer, I would rather have a complete and polished project rather than a rushed one. Surprisingly, the wiki is already packed full of information related to its story, potential gameplay, characters, development, and a whole list of all of its teasers. So with everything so far, this was a series that had quite a bit of extensive history that surprisingly spanned much further than I would have guessed. This video didn't even touch on most of the information presented within the game's lore, development history, nor the cancelled projects. But that's all for another day. Kane, if you ever do watch this, I do wish you succeed. And when that project finally does come out, I hope you're very happy with the results. If you like this video, like and subscribe. Comment down something below. What's your favorite Pop Goes game, or even your favorite Pop Goes character? In the meantime, I'm extremely tired for talking for so long, so I'm going to go take a nap. Peace. A quick thank you to Ori, Brian Strix, Duck, Krev, Ryan Brewers, Samir Butenez, Kingly, Beyond, and Appletree. Thank you all for supporting the channel by becoming members.